second lecture on Tuesday, uh, we established uh, some convergence rate uh, in H1 uh, with a first order corrector, and also in L2, uh, a first order convergence rate. Uh, in the last two lectures, today and tomorrow, we're going to look at uh, another problem, uh, basic problem in quantitative homogenization. Uh, that is the uniform uh, regularity of solutions. So here, uniform uh, means that uh, the estimate uh, we're looking for are uh, estimate with constant independent of the small parameter epsilon. Okay, so uh, there, so uh, today we'll, we'll, uh, we, we're going to look at, I'm going to present uh, the, the method of compactness. Uh, using this uh, compactness method to prove the large uh, scale uh, Lipschitz estimate. Tomorrow we'll uh, going to uh, look at another approach uh, to the regularity problem, uh, not by, by, by compactness, but by the method of convergence rate, something related to what we talk about uh, in the second lecture. Okay? So let me just review uh, what we have done. Uh, so we 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 uh, look here working with a family of second order elliptic operators in divergence form. Uh, so you have a parameter epsilon appear in the denominator denominator of the variable uh, x uh, in a coefficient. The basic uh, assumptions are this coefficient matrix A is real bounded measurable and uniform in elliptic, and also A is periodic, uh, okay? So more precisely, uh, so elliptic, ellipticity means that you have a positive constant mu, uh, so the matrix is positively definite, bounded below by, by mu. Uh, we're gonna put the upper bound by mu to the power negative one, okay? And uh, one periodic, uh, we can, we, it means that it's periodic with respect to the integer lattice, okay? Uh, for the notation simplicity, uh, we're gonna just work with the scalar case, but everything we do today holds for, uh, for second order systems in divergence form there, here. Okay, so, uh, so the question we're gonna look, look at is what is the, sharp regularity of solutions we, uh, we, can, we can prove. So we start with, we look at this uh, equation, the operator L epsilon defined in the first page, uh, and omega and f are fixed, and we ask the question, what is the sharp regularity of the solution uniformly with respect to epsilon? So here we look at uh, Something we done, we did in, in lecture one. Uh, we we show that uh, uh, if you have uh, a linear function, this is just the x k, and you add a scaled uh, corrector to the linear function, you actually end up with a solution, uh, entire solution uh, in the whole space. So we take this solution and we you take the derivative. Here, the first term is a, is a linear function. You take the derivative, that's just a constant. And uh, uh, for the second term, you're going to have uh, 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 epsilon to the power negative one uh, comes out, which cancel this factor epsilon. So this is the, uh, the, you don't need to worry about this first term, just constant. So what is the best regularity you can have uniformly with respect to epsilon for the second term? And it's, it's clear that unless the corrector is zero, uh, you cannot expect this uh, derivative to be more than just being bounded. It, it's not even uniformly continuous. So the best regularity we can hope for is Lipschitz, con Lipschitz regularity. There's no C1 alpha here. So, and, uh, so there's no C1 alpha estimate here. So the, the classical theorem I want to start, uh, talk about, actually we're gonna prove, uh, we're gonna present a proof today using compactness method 
is due to Marco Avalinda and Fang Hua Lin back in 87. So let's look at the assumption here. So here I come up with the uh, upper index, uh, indices, just indicate the, re the results uh, holds also for systems, second order systems in divergence form. Uh, assuming this matrix is elliptic, periodic, and Hilder continuous. Uh, domain is C1 alpha, so you, you solve a, a Dirichlet a boundary value problem. Uh, the right-hand side is F, the boundary data is G, and the theorem states that uh, the, the gradient of the solution uh, is uniformly bounded up to the boundary by a constant C. The, mo the most important thing here is that C is independent of epsilon uh, times the LP norm of uh, the right-hand side plus the C1 sigma norm of the boundary data. Okay. So this, this theorem is sharp in, in several fronts. Uh, as I mentioned, there is no C1 alpha. This is a Lipschitz estimate uh, up to the boundary, the best you can hope for. Uh, but, but it's also sharp in terms of the assumptions, uh, omega being C1 alpha. Uh, in general, uh, even for harmonic functions, there's no Lipschitz uh, estimate on C1 domains. Uh, the, the assumption P greater than the dimension is also sharp. Uh, you can see that from the representation of the uh, fundamental solution, even for Laplacing. And uh, C1 sigma norm is also sharp. I mean, you cannot have a C1 here. Uh, that's not true even for harmonic functions. So that is uh, uh, the Lipschitz estimate. Uh, for uh, for Dirichlet problem here, okay. So they, there is a, also a theorem uh, for the Neumann problem. Uh, the assumption is the same. Uh, the coefficient is elliptic, periodic, and the Hilder continues. The domain is one alpha. So instead of instead of uh, Dirichlet problem, we're going to look at the Neumann problem. So this uh, the equation is. It's the same, and here you have uh, the core normal derivative uh, specified on the boundary. Uh, let me just remind you the, the core normal derivative of associate with this operator is n dot with uh, the coefficient uh, multiplied by the gradient. So this is just the uh, the flux in a normal direction. That's the core normal derivative of the function here. And so, so here you have uh, uh, the L infinity norm of the gradient, the Lipschitz norm, uh, uniformly bounded by the LP norm of F, P greater than dimension, plus uh, the C sigma norm of the Neumann data. Uh, so here, because the Neumann data is already uh, pose on the derivative, you certainly you don't put a one C one sigma data as in the Dirichlet case. You have a C sigma. Sigma is any uh, any number greater than zero. Here. Okay. So the, the theorem was uh, proved originally uh, by Kanik, uh, Lin, and myself back in uh, 2013. Under additional assumption that uh, the coefficient also being uh, symmetric, uh, later on uh, uh, Scott Armstrong and myself uh, removed that uh, uh, condition and also proved uh, this uh, theorem and the previous theorem in the case of almost periodic uh, case uh, using uh, the method we're going to talk about tomorrow. Okay, uh, here. All right, so, uh, so I will spend most of the time uh, showing, I mean, showing you the compactness method in a very, in, in a simplest setting, that's the interior estimate, okay? So this, this is uh, due to Avalinda and, uh, and Feng Hua. And uh, in this theorem here, uh, in the previous two theorems, we're assuming that the coefficients actually are Hilda continuous, but it's only used in the small scale. So this, 
This theorem, you can think, is a large-scale estimate. There is no smoothness assumption on the coefficient. This, this theorem is true for bounded measurable coefficients. So you, you have a, everything scale can be scaled in a, in a unit ball, uh, a B1, B1, and you have a solution, let's for the, for the simplicity, let's just say the right-hand side is also zero. You can have a similar estimate, you have a, a fourth in term there. So I want to simplify every, every setting here. So the estimate is the following, that is, so if you, if you average the solution, the gradient of the solution squared on a ball of radius r. r is any uh, number between the parameter epsilon and one. And we cannot go down below epsilon. Uh, and that will require uh, uh, regularity on the coefficients. This is bounded by, by the, uh, the average on the ball of radius one, okay? And the constant c is independent of uh, dimension and the mu is the ellipticity. Uh, again, let me just emphasize that uh, no smoothness assumption uh, is required uh, for this theorem. This is a large scale uh, uh, theorem, okay? Are there any questions? All right, so let's see uh, uh, why this is called ellipsis. Uh, estimate, a uh, large-scale Lipschitz estimate. Uh, it turns out once you have this uh, large-scale estimate, you combine with the classical local estimate, uh, you will have the Lipschitz estimate in full scale. Okay, uh, this is a very simple blow-up argument. Let's say you put an additional assumption that the coefficient is Hilder continuous uh, of order lambda here, Lambda is anything between zero and one. And uh, so we're gonna show that uh, whenever you have a solution in a unit ball, uh, then the gradient at the center of, of the ball is bounded by the L2 average of the gradient on the ball radius one. Okay, and the constant now will depend on the dimension, the ellipticity constant mu, and this uh, lambda and m in the Hilder continuity assumption. Okay, so how do you prove this? Well, uh, we're gonna do this in two steps, okay? First of all, we know that if the parameter epsilon is greater or equal to one half, or some number greater than zero, then the, the estimate uh, here is classical. That is because if epsilon stay away from zero, then the coefficient you have you have here x over epsilon is uniformly Hilder continuous in epsilon. Okay, so the classical uh, Hilder estimate will give you this, this directly. Okay, so that's the first observation. Okay, so now we can assume that epsilon is between uh, zero and one half. Okay, so first of all, we do a blow up uh, argument and we rescale. So you, you, you're looking at, so you have a solution. You have a solution L epsilon, uh, U epsilon equal to zero in, in B1, okay? And then you rescale, uh, I'm gonna call the function uh, U epsilon of epsilon. So you change the variable from x to epsilon of x. So you, so you blow up the solution. And, uh, and then you, you also multiply uh, epsilon to the power negative one, okay? And then you see that uh, if you take the gradient of v, this epsilon cancel, there's epsilon come up, cancel this epsilon to negative one, you simply have a, uh, gradient of epsilon evaluate at epsilon of x. Epsilon of x. The thing is that this function here will satisfy the equation uh, with parameter one. That's how the, the, the operator, the co operator rescales here. So V will 
be a solution for the operator L1. I mean, that's a classical operator, and we simply apply the classical C1 alpha estimate, or Lipschitz estimate, to V, and you end up with this uh, uh, inequality. The derivative at zero is bounded by the L2 average on ball radius one. Okay, and once you have this, and you just change the variable back, this inequality is the same as this one. First of all, the left-hand side are the same, and by a change of variable, the right-hand side also are the same. Okay, so that is uh, the the blue inequality here. Okay, so this step use the Hilder continuity, but it does not use the periodicity. This is a small scale estimate, okay? So the large scale estimate come up in the second step. That is, the average on the ball of radius epsilon is bounded by the average of, you can, you can put, a gra put a gradient here, it doesn't really matter because they're more or less equivalent by Catropoli. So on, on the ball of radius one. That's the second step here. The red inequality is precise. Well, now this one, this should be this one. You take R to be epsilon here. Okay, so that is, that is the proof of the full scale uh, Lipschitz once you have the large scale uh, estimate. Okay, do you have any questions? Uh, because the catropoli, they are more or less equivalent. Yeah, I can go to B one half uh, by the gradient, and then you get rid of the gradient by catropoli from B one half to B one. Yeah, thank you. There. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whenever you have a local estimate, then then it's okay. Yeah. So this just completely separate the small scale and the large scale here. The large scale does not use any smoothness uh, of the coefficient here. All right, so now let's, let's just try to prove this, how the, how the proof goes. The compactness uh, approach, it's, uh, so here we're going to uh, have to work with a, a class of, of, uh, of matrices, not just one matrix, so I'm gonna call M of mu to be the class of all matrix D by D that, that it's one periodic, they have the same uh, period, and also uh, same ellipt ellipticity and uh, mu to the mi minus one half. Okay, so in all this calculation, mu is fixed but the matrix are changing here. And so the compactness we're doing here, is of, we are working with all the operators of this form, that epsilon is positive and A is any matrix in the class of M of mu. So we're, we're not just working with one matrix, but we work with family of matrices. And A is also allowed to change, as long as it's in that class of M of mu. Okay, so this, this, this is the reason that uh, in the first lecture I actually insist that we're working with a, a sequence of matrices instead of one. Although if you only work qualitative theorem, you only need one matrix. So what is the theorem? The theorem is, we all proved this, we proved that this in, in the first lecture. So let's say you have a solution. Uh, it's a sequence, you have a sequence of solutions in, uh, in a domain omega, uh, and uh, epsilon k goes to zero, and a sub k uh, is in a class of m of mu, and uh, we're gonna assume that uh, this uh, sequence is bounded in H1. So the H1 norm is uniformly bounded in K. And then we can claim that up to a subsequence, there's a subsequence which will still denote by U sub K, uh, so that uh, U sub K converge to U0 weekly in H1. That's not surprising because 
any bounded sequence in the Hilbert space has a weak, uh, a weakly convergent subsequence, not a problem. They, 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 uh, the, the interesting part, the key part is that the limit uh, actually satisfy a equation uh, with a constant coefficient here. So um, u0 is a solution of, of uh, divergence form uh, operator second order with constant coefficients. And so we, that was proved uh, in, on Monday in, in the first lecture. And we're going to use this theorem today here. All right, questions? Okay, so uh, let me just briefly review what we uh, already, uh, how do we prove it. So first of all, uh, we can find a subsequence which converge in H1. Uh, we can pass to another sub subsequence so that uh, AK hat converges, uh, uh, this is as a, as a sequence of a constant matrix that converges to another constant matrix. All right, that just the compactness in the Euclidean space. Okay, and the limit satisfy the same elliptic lower same lower bound, but the upper bound may be different, but only depend on the dimension and the mu here. And then we use a DV lemma or uh, Tata's testing function method to show that uh, uh, the flux also weakly convergence in L2. And once you have this, then you know the uh, limit u0 will be a solution because you can just multiply by Tai's function and integrating omega, and that's, that's what you need. Okay? So that's what we uh, done in the first lecture here. So now let's see how we uh, use the compactness to prove the uh, interior uh, regularity. Okay? So this uh, using a uh, a, uh, a compactness and an iteration argument here. There, there are two steps here. So let's see how we set this up here. Okay. So everything work, uh, is happening in a unit ball. Uh, we can always scale into a unit ball center origin. And we're going to fix a, uh, a number sigma. Okay, it doesn't have to be small. Any number between zero and one. The claim is that there are two other. That there are two small uh, numbers. One is called epsilon zero. Another called s a theta. It's epsilon zero between zero and one half, and theta between zero and, and one quarter. Uh, small, which depend only on d mu and sigma. Okay, it does not particularly depend on the matrix. It only depends on this uh, elliptic constant mu. So that whenever epsilon is less than epsilon zero, whenever you have a solution uh, in a unit ball uh, with some matrix A belongs to uh, this class, then you have this estimate. Okay, so what is this estimate here? Okay, so here you, this is the average on the ball radius, uh, ball radius uh, theta. The solution minus its average on the ball radius theta. And then you subtract, this is, this, this is very much like a Taylor expansion. It is, it is a Taylor expansion, except that you, we introduce the correctors into this formula. If you, if you don't put a uh, uh, corrector, that's just the, the second term, which is a linear function multiplied by the derivative. But instead of a derivative, evaluate at some point, we put the average of the derivative. Okay? Uh, there's a good reason for that. We like average is because point-wise, the derivative does not converge strongly. Okay, so you sub so you measure the the, the this this difference, and uh, at a scale s uh, sigma, it decays like sigma to the square to the power two plus two times sigma. This is the same sigma here, times the uh, L2 norm of, uh, well, the, the average of, uh, of u epsilon squared. 
So that is, this is the setup here, okay? So it's the first step, uh, it's, uh, it's called a one step imp improvement. Once we get this done, we're gonna iterate this, this argument, this estimate uh, from scale one all the way to scale epsilon. This is an iteration here, okay? Uh, I'll tell you why we, I'll tell you now why we need uh, to have this uh, corrector in this place. Certainly, without a corrector, this is still true by the same proof. However, when you go to the second step, if you want to iterate, you realize that then this term, the constant is always a solution, but if you only have a linear function, it's not going to be a solution. So one important reason here well, there's much deeper reason than that is that uh, this guy is a solution to the operator L epsilon. <coughs> and therefore, you can iterate the, this, this uh, inequality uh, repeatedly up to the, sc uh, the scale epsilon here. You, you'll see how this is done in the second step, in the second lemma. So for now, let's just look at how, how this lemma is proved. Any questions? Yes. There's no. This we're working with interior estimate, so I don't need. There's no omega here. Later on, we're going to talk about the boundary Lipschitz uh, toward the end of the lecture. Yeah, this will give you interior Lipschitz. So we're working with the ball and then to Bob radius one, and then you have estimate to a Bob radius one half. So it's an interior estimate. Okay, so how do you prove this? You prove this by contradiction. Compactness, just argue by contradiction. All right? So I'm gonna choose a theta. How do I choose theta? I'll tell you later. There's a reason. Of, so we're gonna assume that there's no such epsilon zero for this chosen theta. Suppose there's no epsilon, okay? And uh, we're gonna find some contradictions. So if, there, if there's no epsilon, then any small epsilon k will not be true. So what that means is that there must be a, a sequence of epsilon k which goes to zero. There must be a sequence of matrices belongs to this class. There must be a solution to in the in the ball of radius one, so, uh, so you can you can uh, normalize that uh, the L two norm is one, so that you have the reverse inequality. So we claim so we claim that this is sorry, where is it going back here? So we claim that this quantity is less or equal to. Uh, theta square, theta to the power of two plus two sigma times this integral, and here we're assuming it's greater, or maybe strictly greater than theta to the two plus two plus sigma, okay? The integral there is already normalized to one, okay? So here I want to mention that uh, there's a corrector chi k, but this is the corrector for the matrix A super k for this matrix. We have a sequence of matrix, so we have a sequence of characters in this. But they're all uniformly bounded in L2, though, because the mu is fixed. All right? And then we're gonna simply take the limit, and I will give you the contradiction, okay? So how do we do it? Well, first of all, by Cartopoli, you can go to a smaller ball, because, because this uh, u sub k, the L2 norm is one, so you go to a smaller ball, it will be uniformly bounded in H1, and therefore you can find a subsequence so that uh, it converges weakly in H1. We can also go to a subsequence so that u sub k converge weakly in L2 of B1 because the norm, uh, the norm of uk is one. Okay, and then we go to another subsequence, subsequence of subsequence, so this, uh, uh, the effective matrix of AK also converge. 
because they are bounded, they must be converge uh, subsequence and converge subsequence. Okay? And this allow us to apply the compactness theorem I stated earlier. That is, that subsequence will converge uh, weakly in H1, so that, so here, let me see, you have, so we have, we have, let's just, look at what, what this uh, subsequence satisfies, they, they uh, U sub K squared B1 is one, and uh, the average of U sub K minus, U sub K minus, x plus epsilon k chi, x over epsilon k, should be chi k here. And uh, this is a vector value function, dot with the average of the gradient of u sub k squared is greater than sigma uh, theta to the power of one plus uh, two sigma. Okay, so we take the limit, well, k goes to infinity by, by the, uh, uh, the limb soup property of upper semi-continuous, they call B1, the limit will satisfy, uh, well, I can now get one, but I know it's less or equal to one. Okay, and you take the limit here, this will, U sub k converge in L2. Well, uh, well, in B theta, so you got the limit B theta V here minus, V convergence gives you this average minus X, okay? This sequence here is uniformly bounded in L2, so this term goes away because e epsilon k goes to zero, you still have an X left, and uh, this also converge because of your weak convergence. So I mentioned earlier that you, can, you do not want to put a pointwise, evaluate the derivative, you want to average here, so it'd be at B theta, then you have a grade uh, square greater or equal to theta two plus two sigma. All right, that's what I have on the bottom line there. Okay? And that will be a contradiction, and why is that? Okay? So the reason that's not gonna be true is because the limit V is a solution of a constant coefficient. And a constant coefficient, if the right-hand side is zero, then they are C infinity, they are analytic, uh, but all we need is C2. Okay, so let's just check that. So you have this copied from the last line, and then we use Taylor expansion. This is true for any function v, it doesn't have to be a solution to bound this by the second order derivative in L infinity norm in a b, say that it's less than one quarter, so just move on to one quarter here. Okay, this red inequality is the C2 regularity estimate for elliptic systems with constant coefficients. So you have uh, the L2 norm of the two derivative 